Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for that uh, very long and kind introduction. Um, and thanks to Jan and to Janine for, uh, for organizing this lecture series. It's an honor for me to participate um, in, uh, in the lecture series. I'd rather be in Bonn right now, but um, you know, we'll have to make do with this format. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is something that I've been uh, thinking about um, in the course of my own research project. And uh, uh, Stefan mentioned that I'm, I'm, I'm currently um, on this research project that examines runaway slaves in North America in the 19th century. So in the, the last 50 years, 50, 60 years of slavery in uh, the United States. And um, I'm really interested in strategies of escape, how people attempted to escape slavery. And what I've been looking at, and this, this is just something that I've been thinking about for the past year and that I wanted to share with you. Um, one of the things that I'm looking at is, is how enslaved people tried to run away within the South. So not to free territories, but within the South itself and just by hiding out. And I'll start with a little anecdote that I hope illustrates uh, what I mean. What you see before you is uh, a newspaper from Washington, D.C. Uh, from the summer of 1825. And it's full, what I've circled there, it's full of runaway slave advertisements. Um, many of you know what runaway slave advertisements are. Uh, these, uh, you know, when a slave ran away, their master would often place an advertisement, an announcement in the local newspaper or in the newspaper in the city where they were assumed to be hiding. Um, in order to uh, help recapture that slave. And these advertisements are wonderful sources for historians because they're full of information about uh, why the slave ran away, their strategies for doing so, where they were presumed to be hiding out, and how, what their networks were. They're great uh, sources for historians who, who, who deal with escaping uh, slavery. Um, and I want to draw your attention to one advertisement near the bottom, and it's okay that you can't read it, I'll just explain it. Um, but this advertisement near the bottom uh, deals with the case of a runaway slave named Moses Hutcherson. Quote, a likely black fellow about 23 years old from the state of Maryland, who in the spring of 1825 apparently determined that he was no longer going to live in slavery, do or die. Um, now, he lived in Maryland, and like many slaves in Maryland who wanted to escape slavery, Moses initially tried to escape by simply running away to the neighboring state of Pennsylvania, which was a free state at the time in, in the 19th century. Pennsylvania had already abolished slavery by the 19th century, and Maryland borders Pennsylvania, so uh, the distance is not very far. Uh, you, if you can reach across the north-south borderland there, then you would find yourself in a free state and comparatively safe um, uh, and free. And that's kind of a whole different story, but comparatively safe from slavery. In any case, you would be in a part of the continent that no longer acknowledged uh, uh, slavery within its borders. The problem, so it makes perfect sense for a runaway slave from Maryland to try and get to Pennsylvania. This was common. The problem is that it was dangerous to try to flee across the north-south borderland at this time. It was full of slave catchers, professional slave catchers. People were always on the lookout for runaways uh, because you could get a reward if you caught them. Um, it was dangerous to try and flee across the southern countryside. And crucially, any black person in the southern countryside was presumed to be a slave unless they could prove otherwise, unless they had some paper or note from their master or free papers that proved otherwise. So you couldn't just walk to Pennsylvania without getting stopped in broad daylight, right? Uh, uh, you, you had this, uh, running across the north-south borderland entailed careful planning um, and a certain amount of, of skill. Moses learned this the hard way because in the runaway slave ad, it says he already tried to run away once in April of 1825, trying to get to Pennsylvania, he was caught north of Baltimore, really close to the border with Pennsylvania. He was caught, arrested, sent to jail, and then sent back to his master down in the southern part of the state on the Potomac River. So Moses tried to flee to a free state and failed. Apparently, he did not dwell on his failure for long, however, because a month later, he tried to run, he ran away again. <laughs> 
Um, th that's why this advertisement was placed in the July 1825 newspaper. This is the second time that Moses had run away, only this time he did not try to flee to Pennsylvania. This time he fled to the nearby slaveholding city of Washington. Now Washington was not free at all. Washington was not free soil. Washington was a, a southern city in a slaveholding district surrounded by slaveholding territory. This was not uh, uh, free soil by any means. However, Washington did have a sizable free black population. Like many towns and cities across the South, there were free blacks living in Washington, DC, a lot of them. And so any black person that you saw on the street in Washington, DC was not necessarily a slave. Moses apparently decided that this would be his strategy. He would run to Washington, DC and act as if he were free, act like a free black in an urban environment. He ran there, apparently got a job there, changed his name. Uh, the runaway slave ad, uh, mentions that he changed his name, was known to have, quote, served in many of the taverns and boarding houses of the district, and that he remained, quote, harbored by the free Negroes of that place with whom he is known to have considerable intercourse. Um, so Moses, in other words, escaped slavery, not by going to a part of the continent where slavery was abolished, but by simply going to the nearest city where free blacks lived and acting as if he were free, illegally, disguising his slave status, in other words. It may not have been freedom on paper, but I'm sure to Moses it seemed better than slavery. Well, cases like these, a runaway slave who tries to escape slavery by simply disguising himself as a free person or disguising his slave status and getting lost in the crowd in an urban environment, Cases like these, I think, confront historians with important questions about how slavery worked, how it was meant to work, uh, and where its weak spots were. Uh, more specifically, they raise important questions about the importance of visibility to the successful development of slavery as an institution. And by visibility, I literally mean marking the enslaved somehow, making it known to the wider public that this person is enslaved. Um, this is a topic, this, uh, this issue of uh, slavery and visibility of the slave is a topic that I feel is, is often understudied or, or taken for granted in slavery studies, and yet it is so central to the proper functioning of a successful slave society or of slavery uh, in, in any global society. The only way to keep a human being captive uh, without using chains or lock in a dungeon is to somehow mark them visibly so that the rest of the public knows, the rest of the community knows that these people uh, cannot just simply mingle with the rest of the population, that these people are somehow different, that they have a different status, that they are set apart uh, from the wider society. In the Americas, the visible marker was race. And I know that's another thing we take for granted, but it was certainly not uh, a, a guarantee. But in, in the Americas, what, what, part of what made slavery in the Americas so successful, part of what made it so watertight, was that it was based on a physical characteristic, that it was based on race, it was based on basically skin color, uh, Africans and people of African uh, descent. Um, that's what marked you as a slave or as a potential slave. That's what justified uh, slavery, came to justify slavery in the Americas. America, the Americas were an exception to the rule, of course, right? So you, uh, in other societies, it was not race. In other societies, it was specific hairstyles or the slaves wore collars uh, or there was spe specific clothing that the slaves had to wear. In any case, uh, what's important is that uh, captivity without cages necessitates some kind of visible marker of the enslaved. And I think that for historians, studying the strategies and actions of runaway slaves can help us to understand how this system of captivity functioned in practice, how it was meant to function, and how it could be subverted or undermined uh, by, uh, by the enslaved who wished to escape. Since I'm a historian of North America, of course, I'm going to draw from case studies from my own uh, research, uh, but I'm hoping that the, the underlying theme of visibility and how to subvert your visibility as a slave, I'm hoping that this might uh, resonate with, uh, with some of your own uh, research projects, including those of you who are studying slavery in completely different contexts. And at the end of my talk, I want to um, even come back and show you some 
very basic, uh, well-known examples um, of other uh, societies and how they dealt with visibility and runaway slaves. Uh, but first, um, I think a little background context, context is needed. Um, so I, I mentioned that uh, race became the main marker of slavery in the Americas, and that's true. But the geography of slavery and freedom in North America in the period between the American Revolution and the Civil War um, underwent a major transformation that ended up throwing this whole question of visibility um, and slavery into confusion. Um, first, this was an era in which we saw the, in which we see the first free spaces opening up um, across the continent. These are places where slavery had been abolished, was abolished uh, either gradually or immediately. Um, and so all of a sudden there are territories opening up across the continent that are dedicated to uh, ending slavery. Um, and that means that, that they're, they're basically dedicated to uh, some measure of free soil. So where black people are not necessarily assumed to be slaves anymore, they're assumed to be free unless proven otherwise. And second, just as important, uh, and more important for my talk today, is that in the same period, even in the slave states, the green states that you see uh, in this map, even in the slave states that do not abolish slavery in this period, even there in the generation of the American Revolution, we see a massive uh, wave of manumissions, individual private manumissions by slaveholders from the revolutionary generation who freed some or all of their slaves in their wills. So what you get is the nucleus of a, of a real free black population, even inside the slave states of the South, uh, meaning that all of a sudden, even in the South, uh, not all black people that you see are going to be slaves. Um, and, and since a lot of free blacks tended to gravitate towards cities like Washington, Baltimore, Richmond, uh, 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 Charleston, um, because they tended to gravitate towards cities, a lot of towns and cities across the South, indeed most towns and cities uh, across the South, uh, contained free black neighborhoods uh, and small free black populations. In some of these towns and cities, they contained major free black populations. In places like Baltimore and Washington and Richmond, you had major free black populations. In Baltimore and Washington, uh, by the 1830s, uh, the free black population outnumbered the local slave population within the city limits. So you're talking about cities where many of the black people you see on the street, indeed most of the black people you see on the street are not necessarily slaves, right? These developments in this era, this, this half century before, uh, before the emancipation, the final emancipation, stimulated new waves of slave flight. Obviously running away from slavery was not new, but these developments really added impetus to running away, the strategy of escaping slavery by running away. Droves of Americans in this period fled to either parts of the continent where slavery had been abolished in the hope of finding protection or asylum uh, to some degree. Um, and just as important, droves of enslaved people ran away to these southern cities close by where they attempted to simply pass themselves off as free, where they tried to, like Mo Moses Hutcherson, where they tried to get lost in the crowd, um, become anonymous in an urban environment, and simply act as if they were free, literally perform freedom. Uh, their, their, their lives became a, a kind of theater, you could say. Um, not unlike uh, the, the, the lot of, 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 of undocumented immigrants uh, today, for example. Um, these are people who act as if they are legally allowed to be somewhere, and they're not. Uh, but if they can pass themselves off well enough uh, and slip under the radar and just stay living in the shadows, they're hoping to get by. Um, and that's exactly how these runaway slaves navigated urban areas within the South in this half century before freedom finally came. Um, and I'm fascinated by this last group. You know, as I said, uh, slavery in the Americas was so extreme and so successful precisely because it was based on race, something that could not be um, easily uh, uh, erased. Uh, but now all of a sudden, after the American Revolution, all of a sudden, all of that gets thrown into confusion. The, 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 the intrinsic link between, uh, um, uh, between race and slavery, 
is sort of broken, uh, even within the South, in urban areas in the South, it's not guaranteed at all that the black person that you see on the street is a slave. So this link between slavery and blackness doesn't, is no longer watertight in this era. And enslaved people use that to their advantage in order to try and escape slavery illegally, informally um, within the urban South by performing freedom. Why and how they did so is uh, a question that I think remains largely unanswered in, um, in, in uh, a lot of scholarship or is at least often overlooked in, in the scholarship. So I wanna um, go through this and just show you um, some of the strategies that enslaved people used to try and literally erase their visibility as slaves, escape slavery, not by going to a part of the continent where uh, slavery was abolished and where they could try and claim some type of protection or asylum, but by escaping slavery simply by removing their visibility as slaves. Because uh, I think this really gets to the heart of how slavery was supposed to function and how uh, it often didn't function very well. Um, so I'll, sh I'll go through the best practices, if you will. These are the best practices, uh, the strategies that I'm uncovering in, in southern towns and cities across the South um, of how enslaved people did this, how they navigated these urban environments. Number one, the first best practice is, you know, visibility is everything. So uh, the first order of business is to literally look free. And I mean that in a physical sense. Um, most runaways, for most runaways, this often meant procuring the more fanciful clothing of the free urban black population um, to replace the ragged rags or the ragged clothing that often gave them away as country slaves. And this is clear from runaway slave ads in southern newspapers across the South. They very often mention that a slave had run away, was suspected to be hiding out in a city uh, within the South and that they had taken different clothing with them or taken more fanciful clothing with them or stolen clothing from the masters in a clear attempt to try and pass themselves off in public as urbanites and not as these ragged country uh, peasant looking uh, 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 slaves from the countryside. And on slave people in the countryside, they had awful clothing. They got usually two pairs of clothes a year from their master. It was very coarse material, very dirty, uh, very, uh, uh, just very basic and uncomfortable. Uh, and it was clearly clothing that was meant for hard farm work. It was not meant for urban life. Well, runaways who went to uh, towns and cities across the so South um, often prepared to look free by taking different clothes with them, even stealing different clothes in order to look more urban. Um, I'm showing you one example from the Alexandria Gazette. Alexandria in this time was a, a district of Washington, D.C. Um, uh, uh, on the Virginia side of the river. Um, so Ben, a 21-year-old slave from Virginia, ran away to the district in 1828 uh, quote, where he has several acquaintances of his color, and he was mentioned to have taken a black fur hat with a sash around it, a gray casnet roundabout blue vest, and ditto pantaloons. He also took with him a white pair of corded pantaloons. Not exactly garb for uh, a slave from the Virginia countryside. Uh, this was clearly not clothing that you would uh, hoe tobacco with. Uh, this was clearly uh, clothing to uh, uh, to live in, in, in an urban setting. Another runaway slave who was suspected of hiding out in Livingston, Alabama, um, a town with another free black population, was uh, seen wearing, quote, a black coat, cashmere overcoat and a silver huntman's uh, watch. Uh, I don't even have a black uh, uh, cashmere overcoat uh, uh, and I also don't have a silver huntman's watch. So it was, again, not, not exactly slave garb. Um, many slaves uh, uh, were presumed to have taken several uh, outfits with them in order to change often. Um, again, uh, in slavery in the countryside, you often only had two uh, outfits, one for the summer, one for the winter. In an urban environment, the idea was to sort of try and follow the fashion as much as possible, as, as poor as, 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 uh, as most free blacks were. So they're often presumed to have taken a lot of different clothing uh, with them. Uh, I'll give you another example from Charleston, for example. Louisa, a mulatto girl from South Carolina who ran away to Charleston in 1822, uh, had, quote, taken more than one dress with her, and it is likely that she will change often. Uh, you see this throughout runaway slave ads across the South, that they are 
uh, that they are taking clothing with them that is meant to make them look free, look urban, um, and, and not look like ragged uh, refugees from the countryside, right? So you want to look free. This is a, 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 a pattern that you see uh, from runaway slaves uh, who are trying to just act free in uh, the southern, uh, in southern urban areas. They, they look free by dressing free. That's number one. Another best practice, another pattern that you see um, is that they hire themselves out as if they were free blacks. The physical appearance of legal freedom was crucial not only for navigating public spaces anonymously, um, but also for finding employment and making a living. Obviously, this, this is the most important um, aspect of, of, of creating a life in freedom for yourself. Southern towns and cities were attractive destinations for runaway slaves precisely because they offered uh, opportunities to find employment and sustain themselves potentially indefinitely. And they did this by hiring themselves out as if they were free, which meant looking and acting free, literally showing up and acting as if you have a right to hire yourself out. Um, to the great frustration of slaveholders throughout the South, who often mention in petitions to the legislature, but also in runaway slave ads, that they are furious and frustrated that uh, urban employers often hire runaway slaves without asking for papers and without really even caring uh, what their status was. Uh, so clearly this was widespread. Um, and and you know, they, they, it's not like these people uh, ran away to the city and, and lived La uh, Dolce Vita or anything. This was not exactly an ideal uh, life. They lived in the margins. They lived, they performed very menial tasks, menial jobs, uh, they, they very much connected with uh, a free black underclass. Um, so a sampling of, of cases from Charleston um, is illuminating here. Um, you see that they're just, they're working at wharves, they're working on construction sites, they're doing day labor, basically just doing very low, poorly paid labor in an attempt to not be seen, not be noticed. Um, even if they are skilled, they tend not to perform their skills in an urban environment because that would give them away, right? If you're a skilled blacksmith and you run away to a local city and you're working as a blacksmith, it's going to be easy for your master to find you. Whereas if you're just doing showing up at the wharves and doing day labor here and there, uh, it'll be easy. It'll be more difficult to track you, right? Um, and you see this throughout the South. Charleston is full of these kinds of uh, mentions in their runaway slave ads. And I'm just mentioning one here. Um, ben Elliott, uh, who had been, he was from the South, from the Charleston area. He was sold to Georgia and then he ran back to Charleston um, and was acting as if he were free, living with a free woman um, and had already been spotted several times by people um, who said that they had seen him working on the wharves uh, on board the vessels as a stevedore or an assistant. So when a ship came in, um, free blacks and runaway slaves would congregate at the wharves and offer to unload, you know, as a stevedore, unload the ships, unload the cargo of the ships. And this, this was like day labor. Um, this, this is the kind of labor that is being performed uh, by, by runaway slaves who go to the city. So the nature of urban economy is sort of relegated runaways and free blacks for that matter to the bottom of the ladder. They, nobody, was, nobody was living it up uh, in the cities for sure. Um, most eked out a living at best um, and we also see this because um, there are also sources of runaway slaves collaborating with free blacks um, in basically organized crime as well. Um, so stealing rings, uh, theft uh, uh, where, uh, where you know, uh, valuable goods and materials are, are being stolen from the harbors and, and sold illegally. Again, Charleston is full of this because the legislature was just flooded with petitions by angry uh, by angry uh, white residents um, who cried out unfair competition from, uh, from rings of free blacks and, and runaway slaves who were basically operating to steal cotton bales and sell them illegally to merchants uh, in the harbor. Uh, also construction, they were working in construction groups, but they were stealing the materials. So they were stealing bricks and then offering themselves as bricklayers. Um, this turns up in, uh, especially in the, the municipal records uh, a lot. So, so apparently these, these people are clearly not exactly making a good living in the city. They're working the most menial, um, you know, uh, underclass types of, of jobs. 
But, um, but nevertheless, they are trying to make themselves, uh, they are trying to sustain themselves in an urban setting by, by hiring themselves out and by performing, by collaborating basically with free blacks and, and, and performing the same labor that free blacks perform. So hiring yourself out, you wanna look free when they ran away to cities, they wanted to hire themselves out and, and try to sustain themselves, make a living uh, by hiring themselves out as if they are free blacks. Um, a third pattern that you notice when you look at this, uh, at this theme across the South is that they intermingle uh, with free blacks to a great extent. Um, the reason, I mean, that's the, the most important part of becoming anonymous and sort of getting lost in a crowd of free blacks is to intermingle with the free blacks, establish connections with the free blacks, uh, make sure that you look and are with free blacks so that you become indistinguishable from them in uh, public places. Um, the reason that runaway slaves were able to engage in economic activities and making a living for themselves in the urban South is because they were very well connected with free blacks living in the cities. Um, and also because, you know, in the public, in the urban environment, they were virtually indistinguishable from free blacks. Um, they could navigate urban areas and openly explore economic opportunities uh, because they lived with and around uh, free blacks. They were to the authorities of most cities in the uh, antebellum South, um, runaway slaves are basically indistinguishable from, from free blacks. And it's actually even more complicated than I'm laying out here because there wasn't an easy um, split between free blacks and runaway slaves in the cities. The cities, all, all Southern cities contained a, a confusing spectrum of black freedom and unfreedom. And it was never clear to the authorities who was what. Um, I'll give you some examples from Richmond. Richmond is a great case study for this. Um, Virginia, Richmond is the capital of Virginia. In Virginia, there were a lot of manumissions in the revolutionary era, something like 10% of the Virginia black population becomes free by 1806. And then in order to regulate and sort of stop the growth of the free black population in 1806, the Virginia legislature closes the doors to manumission again and makes it much more difficult. And when they did that, one of, the, one of their policies was to, uh, 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 to pass a law that said that anybody who was manumitted, any black person who was manumitted from slavery um, henceforth has to leave the state within 12 months. It's like a self-deportation order. And of course, nobody did that. Nobody actually left. Um, so you had a weird spectrum of black freedom and unfreedom in places like Richmond, which were very much industrializing cities, growing rapidly, attracting a lot of black labor. But in Richmond, you know, you see a black person on the street. This could be a legitimate slave, uh, the slave of, of, of an urban resident, it could be a runaway slave. It could be a legitimate free black person with papers. It could be a legitimate free black person who is living illegally in Virginia, who was supposed to deport, but didn't, just stayed. Um, it could also be a hired slave from the countryside where the master hires them out in the city to do a job. And then, you know, they, they have to give their money back to their wages back to the, to the master. So if you go down the street in, in, in Richmond, it's unclear who's who. And runaways are only one, one group um, of, of a sort of confusing spectrum of, of freedom and unfreedom. So that means that, you know, there, if you're living in, in the black neighborhoods and you're hiring out with black people, uh, with, the free black, uh, uh, with the free black population, and you're sort of performing the same types of jobs, you're virtually indistinguishable uh, to the authorities uh, from free blacks uh, living in the city. And not only were you indistinguishable in the sense that, you know, nobody ever knew what exactly, who was what status, but then, you know, they, they, they lived together, they, they frequented the same grog shops together, uh, they married across status lines, uh, all of these different groups were marrying each other and starting uh, families together. Um, they all attended the same churches. Uh, you, you really see this in the church records. Um, that, I think this is one of the most interesting uh, sources that I found from the first, uh, that one of my PhD students found actually, from the first African Baptist church in Richmond, Virginia, where, uh, where she found that, that they, they kept registers of marriage records, uh, death records, baptismal records, and they would often mention the status of the black person um, in parentheses. And sometimes, you know, the, sometimes there's just like a question about the status where it says, you know, does this person 
free with a question mark or this person and they leave the status blank. These are clearly people who are sort of passing themselves off as free, but not everybody believes it, or people who are clearly runaways, but they don't want to mention that on paper. Or it's, uh, but you definitely see that free black, I mean, runaway slaves are basically acting as if they're free and they're attending the same churches as if they're free and they're, you know, marrying free people. Um, so they're, they're very much part of this world. They're part of the free black population. Um, this is something that sets North America apart, I think, to, to a certain extent from some of the other, um, uh, some of the other slave societies of the Western Hemisphere of the Americas, and that the, the free black population and the slave population um, in uh, the U.S. Uh, South was very much interrelated and, and uh, uh, very well connected. So they're intermingling with free blacks. They're looking like, they're dressing like free blacks. They're intermingling with free blacks. They're hiring themselves out as if they are free blacks. Um, and then finally, they are procuring false documents in order to prove <laughs> that they are free blacks. The best way for runaway slaves to avoid detection was to acquire false documentation. This is, this is the 19th century equivalent of buying a fake passport on the black market. Uh, just in case you get stopped, uh, or just in case that employer does ask for your papers to prove that you are allowed to hire yourself out as a free person. Um, fugitive slaves' precarious existence in the cities was indeed primarily based on the fact that they lacked formal papers to prove that they either had permission to be in the city or that they were somehow legally free. Um, they were illegal, they were non-citizens, um, and so the very public spaces that provided them with uh, that provided them with anonymity could also provide dangerous encounters with authorities who might ask for their papers and then uh, uh, and then reveal their true identities as runaway slaves. Um, since uh, it's perhaps un, uh, since documentation was so important, it's perhaps unsurprising that a black market in fake papers and fake passes. Uh, thrived throughout the antebellum period in all of the southern cities. Um, this was a, a, a very large uh, uh, activity, economic activity, to, to, to get fake papers um, from free black populations. Um, that, that Runaway slave ads throughout the South in the antebellum period often refer to uh, the fake papers that this person has, uh, has somehow acquired. Um, and I'm just showing you one from Mobile, Alabama, a port town um, from 1836, where uh, his, you know, they, they specifically mentioned he's going to try and pass as a free man because we know he acquired papers uh, under a pseudonym that says that he's free, but he's not. So be on the lookout for him. These kinds of um, uh, these kinds of, uh, of, of this, this kind of phrasing in runaway slave ads throughout the South um, is very common. Uh, and so we know that, that a lot of uh, enslaved people tried to procure false documents just in case, just in case they were stopped by the authorities. Indeed, in the first slide that I showed, that, that Washington newspaper from 18, 1825, um, one of the runaway slave ads uh, was of an entire family, uh, a man and his two adult children uh, and their wives. And not only did they run away to Washington um, from the Virginia countryside. Not only did they run away with fake papers, but indeed the, one of the sons had broken into uh, the town hall of Stafford County in Virginia and stolen the seal of the county, uh, stolen the seal, uh, the county seal that notarizes free black papers. So they, they could just make their own papers uh, and, and actually have a legitimate stamp, a legitimate seal on these free papers. Uh, that uh, that would prove uh, that they found it out that they were legitimate free blacks. Um, these are some of the strategies employed, and this was not a Virginia thing either. It's throughout the South you see this, because all of the Southern states legislated against it. Um, even Southern states with relatively small free black populations, like Mississippi, legislated specifically against this type of practice of against people who helped runaway slaves acquire false documents. This is just one example from Mississippi. All of the southern states had this. Um, but one example of Mississippi that, that threatens to charge any free black who helps a runaway slave copy their free papers. 
copy their register of freedom um, or who copies it for them uh, or sells it to them, any free black who assists a slave to pass for free by helping them get these fake papers will be charged with theft, uh, felony theft of the slave. Um, so serious, a very serious uh, charge. This was something that would land them definitely in prison and often with exorbitant fines of up to $500 or so, uh, depending on uh, the runaway. So procuring false documents to those who could afford it or to, to those who could find it um, was a great advantage for slipping under the radar, acting free. You already have the clothing to look free. You're, you're working with free blacks. You're living in free black neighborhoods. You're going to free black churches. You are acting free in every sense. Um, if you also have fake papers that say you're free, even better. That's, that's a way to cover all. Um, for those who did not, who were unable to procure false documents, then, you know, recapture was a very serious and very real, a regular occurrence. Um, so a lot of Southern cities, uh, some of the bigger Southern cities, including Washington, Richmond, New Orleans, um, actually had runaway slave books. So the police, the jails had separate books to register the runaway slaves. Um, and so you can, you can look and you can see uh, how regular arrests were made, um, sort of compare this to the black population of the time. Um, and, and based on that, try to gauge, um, you know, how successful uh, these runaways were. Um, I'll give you an example from Washington, D.C. Again, the runaway slave book from Washington, D.C. spans from 1848 through 1860, so 12 years, the 12 last years of right before the Civil War broke out. Um, and in these 12 year period, uh, 1,176 runaway slaves were arrested in, and, and, and entered into the runaway slave book. Not all of them were hiding out in Washington, some of them were in transit to the North. Um, but in any case, um, this amounted to um, two thirds of them were, were men, 67.5%, uh, um, which matches almost exactly sort of the, the national average. Two thirds were men, one third were women. Um, what this amounted to was about 98 runaway slave arrests uh, per year. Uh, so just over eight per month. Uh, that may seem like a lot. We of course don't know how many ran away to the city in the first place because their whole purpose was to slip under the radar and not get not turn up in historical documents. Um, but just keep in mind that Washington DC in this period in the 1850s um, contained between 50 and 70, 75,000 residents um, of whom at least 14 to 15,000 were black. So eight a month when you're talking about 15,000 people, 15,000 registered uh, people, uh, probably not, uh, not very high. I mean, uh, it depends on how many ran away to the cities in the first place. But let's say that, you know, under 1% under of the DC black population was arrested on suspicion of being a runaway um, each year by the end of the antebellum period. So uh, recapture was a constant danger, but it looks like the chances for success, and Washington actually had a high arrest rate. Richmond was very low. Richmond had an even bigger black population and only had uh, something like four, three to four arrests per month. Um, so it looks like the chances were actually pretty good um, for runaways to just slip by under the radar indefinitely, certainly in these final two decades um, of slavery. So by way of conclusion, I wanna come back to this question of visibility in slave societies. Um, how did Southern slaves escape slavery in local towns and cities in the 19th century. They did so by performing freedom. They did so by acting as if they were free, by passing for free in a society where the link between blackness and slavery had all of a sudden become confused. Um, how did they do that? They changed their clothes. They changed their names. They hired out their labor as if they were free. Um, they lived with and among free blacks, they intermingled, um, and they acquired false documents just in case. All of these attempts were attempts, all of these strategies were attempts to erase their visibility as slaves. And if they could erase their visibility as slaves in an urban environment where the link between blackness and slavery was not necessarily um, you know, iron strong, they stood a chance of escaping slavery right in broad daylight inside uh, the slaveholding territories. Uh, 
themselves. Um, so again, underscoring this importance of you know, visibility and subverting visibility um, in the functioning um, and, and resistance against slavery. Um, you do see similar issues cropping up in other global slavery uh, and other uh, slave societies um, across world history. And I am not going to pretend that I am anywhere near an expert on the societies that I'm about to discuss. Uh, I'm not. Uh, but uh, I've, I've sort of talked about this issue with colleagues uh, at Leiden University, and um, a couple of my colleagues have pointed out that similar practices can be, um, can be seen in antiquity, for example. And so I just want to draw from, I was trying to, to find societies that were the most, you know, most removed from the antebellum U.S. South in, in, in the 19th century, right? Um, the, the furthest removed geographically and, and, and culturally. And um, antiquity uh, seems like a good place to, to uh, like a good uh, uh, illustration of, of what I'm talking about. So I'm, I'm going to just draw from a couple of examples from antiquity that sort of illustrate similar issues, similar problems with visibility meant to contain people, meant to keep people captive, and the subversion of visibility as a means of escaping captivity. Um, so if you go to Mesopotamia, for example, uh, this is the Ur III period uh, and the Old Babylonian periods, then you look at the law books and the cuneiform tablets, and they actually have laws that specify um, this visibility. Uh, one of the laws that related specifically to runaways and the, the issue of runaways uh, from the town of Esnuna um, states specifically that a slave or a slave woman who belongs to a resident of Esnuna who bears fetters, shackles, the typical way of keeping people captive, shackling them, who bears fetters, shackles, or a slave hairlock will not exit through the main city gate without his or her owner. Uh, the slave hairlock really does it to me. I mean, fetters and shackles, okay, that makes it pretty clear that somebody is a captive or a prisoner. Uh, but the slave hairlock, apparently the, the, the hairdo is what marks these people um, in this society as the enslaved. Obviously, race means nothing uh, in this time period. There are no real physical markers. The word for slave uh, in cuneiform was, did refer to their outsider status and their barbarian status, uh, because the word for slave was literally mountain man or mountain woman, as opposed to the civilized people of the valley. Um, but these mountain men or men, mountain women would not, if they're wearing, you know, uh, the normal clothing of the day, they wouldn't necessarily look any different from, uh, from residents of the valley. Um, so the way to mark them as enslaved, the way to keep them visible to society in, uh, in towns uh, like Esnuna uh, was, to, was to have a, a specific hairdo, a specific hairlock. Um, people with this hairlock were known to be slaves. That's how you marked the slave. And if you had this hairlock, you could not leave the city walls. You could not pass through the city gate. Um, so this is a, 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 a you know, a, a, um, a law that really sort of underscores the same type of issue that I think I was talking about, where a visible marker is meant to prevent somebody from illegally escaping through the city walls. Now, in, also in Mesopotamia, you look a little further down the law book, and then it mentions people who help them get rid of the hairlock. Um, if a barber shaves off the hairlock of a slave not belonging to him, they shall cut off the barber's hand. Uh, cutting off the barber's hand, or cutting off your hand in this society was a punishment for theft. This is very similar to that Mississippi law where that says anybody who helps a runaway slave procure false papers will be charged with theft. Uh, in this case, it's anybody who helps the slave remove this visible marker that is meant to contain them and keep them in captivity by making it known to all that they are enslaved. Um, anybody who helps this uh, slave remove that visible marker and thereby helps them to escape will be charged with uh, theft. So this is something at least that from a completely different slave society where again, the issue of, of visibility and runaways um, really, really stands out. And I think it bears a strong uh, some strong parallels to what I, I think I was talking about um, for my own case study. Another one, um, another very well-known Googleable uh, example, uh, again, that I got from my colleague, uh, 
uh, at Leiden uh, deals with slavery in the Roman Empire. Now, obviously, uh, the Roman Empire had a very large slave population. Uh, it was also very urbanized, uh, the Italian peninsula. And, um, you know, in, in the Roman Empire, running away was a real problem. Again, physical characteristics don't necessarily mark anybody as slaves. Um, and then you have this, the, the issue where, you know, manumitted slaves could, could, could attain citizenship. Um, there, there's no real, there's no physical distinction between somebody who is a potential citizen uh, and somebody who is uh, uh, enslaved, right? So in the Roman Empire, uh, fugitive slaves, the, the issue of, of fugitive slaves was a real uh, problem. And, and Moses Finley famously declared that uh, Roman society, uh, in Roman society, fugitive slaves was, quote, almost an obsession for lawmakers and for slaveholders, that it was too easy for them to, um, to leave uh, and to simply escape uh, their, their masters. And one of the ways that slaveholders devised in order to combat this problem was to make it visible to society who was enslaved and who was not, who was a runaway risk and who was not. So runaway slaves were often branded with FUG on their forehead, uh, meaning fugitivos. So you had uh, people who had already attempted to run away being branded in order to physically uh, mark them uh, as potential slaves, uh, or pot I'm sorry, potential runaways. And then you had uh, slave collars uh, that were increasingly used in the, in the Roman Empire in order to indicate who they were, who they belonged to, um, who their owners were. And uh, that, that literally say that the owner will offer a reward uh, if, you find, uh, if you find this person. So this is, again, collars uh, meant to visibly distinguish uh, potential runaways um, in a slave society where you know, the visibility uh, of the enslaved was not necessarily um, was not necessarily uh, uh, guaranteed. So these are just a couple of examples from uh, that my colleagues gave me uh, when I told them about this here in Leiden, uh, but that I think really speaks to the same the same issue: the importance of visibility to keeping people captive against their will, and the issue of subverting that visibility or or trying to erase that visibility in order to escape. Uh, that captivity. I think this is like a red thread through uh, slave societies and through uh, global slavery that, that perhaps deserves more attention. The, the importance of visibility and the strategy of, of erasing that visibility um, in, in the development of slave societies across the world. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to open it up to questions um, uh, or feedback or comments from you. Um, for those of you who, who I hope uh, are able to take something away from this, uh, from this, and, and apply it to their own research.